Uh, we spent nearly a year looking at allegations of sexual assault and harassment at private schools across New England. And in the course of our reporting, uh, we found it's far more extensive than we expected. We found more than 110 schools in New England alone have faced allegations that uh, teachers and other school employees assaulted students and we found dozens of cases where teachers and other employees quietly moved on to other schools and settings with children after being accused of sexual assault. So I've been a reporter for more than 20 years and this series of stories contained more ethical challenges than I think any other series has that we've ever encountered uh, because we were dealing with so many people and so many schools and so many situations it posed a lot of difficult questions for instance we're finding allegations against more than 110 schools and an even greater number of employees do we report all those uh, and have to and potentially name all those people and the details or do we just selectively name them in the stories? Uh, and we were also faced with challenges and questions about when, when and how do we name people who are accused of abuse? Often these are people who've never been convicted of a crime. So when is it fair to name them in a story? When is it appropriate? Uh, if we didn't name them, we would be accused of covering up sexual abuse. If we did name them, uh, we'd be accused of really lodging very serious allegations against people who hadn't been convicted of a crime. We face similar issues with the victims who are coming forward and, and making the accusations. When do we name them? Uh, if we don't name them, the story lacks as much credibility and force. If we do name them, are we outing victims? In some cases, Victims had filed lawsuits, so was it fair to name them? In some cases, victims talked to us and, and wanted their name used, and in some cases, they changed their mind. So we faced a lot of really thorny questions about who we name, when we name them, uh, and there weren't always clear-cut, easy answers. One thing that I think we learned is that it's really important to be transparent with readers. Disclose as much information as you can so that we wouldn't be accused of, of covering up information. Um, for instance, I think it was helpful that we disclosed who we contacted. I think it was helpful that we explained what our methodology was as much as, as we can. I think it was also important that internally we came up with some guidelines to figure out when we should name people accused of abuse. And we figured out that, you know, if we had, uh, if we had never named somebody in this brief database that we put online of accusations, if they'd never been named in a previous story, if they've never been convicted of a crime, it didn't make sense to name them because they wouldn't, we wouldn't have space in the course of a, a very brief list online to give them a full chance to respond to the accusations uh, and to rebut charges. Within the story, we also had a high hurdle for when we name people. We didn't name people accused of misconduct if it was just by a single student without any paperwork and documentation or a lawsuit or criminal charges. We only named them if there was firm documentation, for instance, schools on the record uh, confirming they investigated and fired a teacher, or there were criminal charges brought that had already gotten publicity, or if we had multiple victims, as we did in some cases. In some cases, we had student after student after student all corroborating the allegations. And in that case, we felt there was firmer ground to at least say that they were accused of abuse and give them a chance to respond. But in other cases where there was just a single student who made a charge, who may or may not be on the record, we gave the victim anonymity if they wanted it, but we also kept the name of the abuser out of the story because we just didn't have enough evidence to prove um, beyond our own 
worries that there was substantial allegations beyond a single student without documentation. Journalism is really important in holding institutions accountable. I mean, we usually think of it as government, but it's also holding private schools accountable, it's holding businesses accountable, it's holding powerful people accountable. Journalism is an independent institution and the, pretty much the one institution outside government that can hold all these parties accountable and help tell stories that otherwise people would never know about, that would be swept under the rug. And hopefully by telling these stories, we can make sure the system works better, give a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have it, and help lead to real reform that will help make a difference in people's lives.